So it's 9.30. Uh, I'm Masaka Maratari from JPX. Uh, I uh, am a chair, session chair of this uh, session, uh, Next Generation Networks. So uh, did you enjoy the last evening uh, social party? Right? Yeah. OK. Uh, there is less people than I thought, but uh, uh, we will start uh, as scheduled. So, uh, okay, uh, first speaker is there. So, uh, uh, I will introduce first speaker. So, uh, the presentation is about segment routing. Uh, it's segment routing session. 2020 uh, comprise of segment routing data plan encoding uh, by Gantar Van de Belde from Nokia. Uh, please come to the stage and give your presentation. Hello, hello everybody. So this is the first time at, I'm actually at an apricot meeting. It's actually quite impressive. It's also impressive that people actually show up on the Friday morning for a slot after the social, so thank you for that. So uh, I also have, uh, so I have about like 30 minutes to speak about segment routing. And what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be talking about uh, the different data plane encodings of what we have. So when we speak about segment routing, we will have a, a choice to make at some point in time what type of segments we're going to be using. Eh? So segment routing can actually use 32-bit segments, or it can actually use 128-bit segments. And the way they are encoded upon the wire is, you know, can be done in different ways. So that is what I'm going to be talking about here. I will not be promoting one solution above the other solution. The only thing what I will be doing here is to give you some thoughts and considerations you know, if you are thinking about segment routing, you know, what to take into account and what the impact will be for your network environment. So I have about 30 minutes. I have about 30 slides. So this is going to be, you know, a heck of a ride, okay? So let's try to make it a little bit entertaining here. So, yeah! So, I have four different topics. Huh? So the first thing is, so this is just the, the setting of the stage here. So if you are implementing a network at this point in time, and if you have any desires to run services on top of your network, most operators I know, they want to run services because the services is actually the part that brings you money, which is a good thing, then you tend to have, in the beginning of your architecture, you need to make a choice. It's like either you want to go to what we have been doing for a very long time, you implement classical MPLS, which means you run technology like LDP, RSVP, policy-based routing, policy mapping, and that actually has been working very well. But what we are seeing nowadays is with the increase of SDN and programmability upon your network, that may not be very well suited for those kind of programmable environments. And that is a reality. So most of the uh, customers I'm seeing eh, from a Nokia perspective, they actually are all running, you know, most of them actually are running MPLS very successfully, but they actually are saying like, okay, you know, Gunter, we are bouncing into the limits of what we can do. So nevertheless, you actually have the choice to go that way. Now, the other solution, you know, the other potential you have is something what is called segment routing. So that is the, the new thing, what people have been looking into. And the plan actually for that is to reduce the amount of technologies you are using and to reduce the state in your network and to make the operation of the network actually simpler. So basically, when you architect the network, you have to pick your poison. Eh? So you have to pick one of them. Either you go the MPLS front, and you keep on doing what you have been doing for a very long time, or you go into the segment routing front, and you start you know, uh, enabling your network for you know, increased programmability. You don't have to. It's a choice you have. So. As I'm talking about segment routing, let's assume you choose the selection of like, let's go segment routing path. So the big difference of where we are, what we do with segment routing, so in classical networks, you route your packets based upon destination IP addresses. Now, that actually, that paradigm is changed with segment routing. You actually forward or switch packets based upon segments. 
Just think about it. You know, you, you switch your packets through the network and you treat your packets based upon segments. So these segments of what you have available uh, for, for you know, adding upon your packet, to impose upon your packet, can be either 32-bit or can be 128-bit. And that is something you will have to think about. So, and the way it actually works yeah, is if you forward a packet through the network, so you don't just add a single segment, you actually you add, you impose upon the packet a sequence of segments. So a sequence of segments actually means, you know, first you go to the first action, you maybe send a packet to a particular destination, then you go to the second segment, you handle the packet, maybe you send it into an, you know, in layer, three v, you know, layer three VPN, for example, and so onwards. So you, have, you add like a sequence of segments, and the packet will be sent through the packet conditioning, which is instructed by the sequence of segments. So this means all the packet handling is imposed upon the packet. The network does not really have any state anymore. It just needs to know where are the segments, and if I get a packet you know, with a particular segment in there, where am I in the segment list, and how do I need to handle the packet? So coming back here, so the segments, what we have, can be encoded as 32 bits, and can be encoded as like 128 bits. More than that later on, how it actually is encoded in a data plane. So the nice thing is because we impose a set, you know, a sequence of segments, there is no more you know, state in the network on what to do with that. Like with MPLS, you have like kind of a soft state with RSVP, for example. Because all of the MPLS labels you know, need to have a mapping table which maps an IP address with labels that is soft state bound most of the time. Then another change actually with segment routing is that the segment itself, they are like natively distributed by you know, imposing into the IGP. So you actually abuse the IGP to distribute the locations of certain segments, just the same as you're using the IGP for distributing the location of IP addresses. You will be using the same paradigm with segment routing, huh? but instead of distributing IP addresses, you still do that. You also distribute segments, which could be like a node segment, could be an adjacent segment, could be whatever type of segment you have available. You have many, many, many of them. And the nice thing why actually segment routing is so successful at this point in time is because it gives you a very nice paradigm. It's like it seems to hit the right balance between distributed intelligence and centralized programming. Now, one thing to be aware of also is something you know, which was like very hot in the industry. It's like uh, the network services header. So this is something which was very hot like a couple of years ago. Now it seems to have, you know, the interest of the industry seems to have cooled down a little bit. So this actually means, so this is like another technology protocol, which can give you additional context about the packet itself. And like, you know, who is the user of the packet, you know, which is the, uh, the mobile antenna the packet, for example, got you know, added upon. So that is something you, you know, which provides you additional context of the packet itself. So the reason I'm mentioning this here is because that is important. Because with 32 bits, you don't really have a lot of space available in the segment. So you, it's very hard to add additional context. If you have 128 bits available, you actually have a very small amount of space available to actually add some degree of context. So if you actually use 128 bits, you have the capability of adding some degree of context about the packet you know, directly embedded into the segment itself. So that is an interesting property. So more than that later on. So my story is really about comparing apples with apples. Now, the reason actually I show this slightly with, with, an, with, with an orange is because people often sort of compare you know, segment routing with, uh, with 32 bits and segment routing with 128 bits as two different things. It is not. It is actually the same thing. You switch packets through the network based upon segments. In one case, the segments are 32 bits. In the other case, the segments actually are 128 bits. Be aware of that. It is not a competition of MPLS versus IPv6 because neither of them is actually MPLS or is actually IPv6. It is you switch packets based upon segments. Different protocol, different technology. Even though it looks similar, it is very, very different. So, so I'm gonna speak about the evolution of segment routing here. So we, I'm gonna go into four phases. So the first phase we actually encountered with, you know, already a few years ago is we actually have segments of 32 bits. Now 32 bits, think about, you know, uh, how we can actually encode it. So we first encode it as an MPLS label. So 
be aware of something here. Eh? So even though I speak MPLS label, if you look into the MPLS itself, then the space you have available is 32 bits, but the real label itself is 20 bits only, and you have 12 bits of overhead, you know, administrative you know, kind of stuff like, you know, type of service, bottom of stack, blah, 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 these kind of things. So if we actually use segment routing using the MPLS labels, then from the data plane perspective, it looks almost identical semantically as an MPLS packet, which is very good because everything what our hardware actually has been using for a very long time can be reused with segment routing with 32-bit segments. So that means we can actually, you know, we can operate it very well. We have very good experience in troubleshooting these things. We have good experience in how to enable services on that, uh, like layer 3 VPNs, layer 2 VPNs. All that stays the same. The only thing that actually changes is the transport mechanism from the ingress to the ingress of, you know, to the egress of the network. So, and a technology sweet spot for this. So, why actually has this been so very successful? You know, on, on, to this point, is because it reduces the complexity in the network. You have like less technology. You, have, you don't really need LDP anymore. You don't need RSVP anymore, and those kind of things. And it's very hardware friendly because all hardware can switch MPLS packets, like nothing. So, how does it look like on the wire? So basically we have our, so the black thing is the original packet on the bottom here. <coughs> so for simplicity's sake, I put this thing as an IP packet, but this could very well be an Ethernet frame, frame if it is like a layer two service. And what we do on top of that is we actually, we stack a set of MPLS labels, but in this case, they're going to be a set of SITs. And then you will route the packet just with MPLS through the network based upon the SITs of what you have available. Now, what we see here is we have like 32 bits per segment, so that's four bytes per segment. So one segment takes like, you know, four bytes, two segments, you know, eight bytes, blah, and so onwards. So this is all very well known. So the second evolution of what we actually saw is doing segment routing using 128 bits. So don't, conf you know, so when we were developing this, we said, okay, like 128 bits, that really looks a lot like the size of an IPv6 address. So let's make it look like an IPv6 address. Now, it is not really IPv6 as such, because the paradigm what we are using with 128 bits, we still do the same thing as before. We're going to be switching the packet based upon a sequence of SITs. So in this case, we're going to be routing or switching the packet through the network based upon a sequence of 128-bit SITs which kind of look like IPv6 addresses. But we need to add them somewhere into the packet itself. So we invented this new source routing header, and we're gonna be inserting those SITs into the source routing header. But just think about what we're doing. Before this actually existed, source routing on core routers was not really very well appreciated by operators. They tried to avoid that. So now actually, we actually we're in the system that we are going to be doing this on behalf of programmability. So, yeah, so one of the elements here, you know, when we are going to go for the 128-bit segment, so for the SRV6 in this case, you know, there are some complications from the hardware perspective to actually do this because, you know, you need to impose a set of SITs and imposing a set of 128-bit SITs is, you know, from a hardware perspective, more complicated than adding a set of 32-bit SITs. So also, if each seat is longer, you know, and if it is just like a location service, then you will actually, you know, burning up more bits on the wire. So you're actually gonna have like, you know, you will have to pay a bit more tax in this case. Nobody likes to pay tax, you know, at all. You would like to reduce the amount of tax. So if you use IPv6, you're gonna be paying more tax for your packets than you would be using like 32 bit six uh, seats. Let's have a look at how it looks actually on the wire. So again, we have our original payload packet. And from the moment we actually inject this packet into the segment routing, you know, uh, SRV6 core, then we need to add, you know, we need to impose the SRV6, you know, SIT itself. The way we're doing that is something, we first have to add the IPv6 uh, encapsulation header. So some vendors call it like, you know, we actually we impose the SRV6 policy. Now, you can call it policy, you can call it whatever you want. 
it is actually an IPv6 encapsulation header, which is going to be 40 bytes. Then you actually add a new source routing header, which is constructed out of eight bytes fixed, you know, which is always fixed. And then you have like a variable part, which is based upon, you know, the size of it is based upon the sets of what you're going to be imposing. So these are going to be a sequence of 128 bit sets. And then at the end, you have something which is uh, also inserted here optionally from a security perspective, if that is what you want, you don't have to do this. It's like an HMAC because as of 6 it's like I mentioned, it's 128 bit. It looks and feels like an IPv6 address. So if the packet actually gets sent between different kind of administrative domains, you need to be, you need to be very, very sure that the packets you send and receive are actually trusted. So in that case, you need to do some sort of like a, like, a, like a security verification on the payload or like on the header at least to make sure that the packet actually is sent correctly. Otherwise, you're gonna be you know, hitting the same problems what you were hitting before with source, route, with source routing itself in the IPv4 world. So you need to avoid that. So just to give you an example. So what does it mean? So from the overhead perspective, huh? so you have like incoming packet here, you have our edge router, and then here you actually have the IPv6 only environment doing, you know, segment routing with 128 bit sits. So this is what we have. We have our payload. We enter the SRV6 area and we actually, we impose our SRV6 policy, which means our IPv6 header, 40 bytes. We add our segment routing header, which is eight bytes fixed plus, plus the number of sits, what you actually are imposing, plus a, an optional HMAC, you know, for a hash on the, on the header itself. This actually means if we look into the traditional payload of the internet, 500 bytes approximately, then it actually would mean you will have 10% of overhead just on the header itself. So let's compare it with what we have with an MPLS kind of environment with 32 bit sits, well, it is less. More on that later on. So, so what we have seen until now is we have 32 bit sits and I speak about MPLS and I speak about 128 bit sits and I speak about IPv6. Now, what we have seen also is that the overhead tax in the 128 bit sits is actually not neglectable eh? because every bit on the wire, you as an operator costs money and you would like to reduce the overhead from that perspective. So the question I often get is like, okay, so can we, Gunter, you know, can we not use 32-bit sits instead, you know, over a native IPv4 or over a native IPv6 backbone environment? And by doing that, reduce the overhead, you know, of what we uh, experience. Of course we can. Of course we can. And it's not because you use 32-bit sits that you cannot go directly over an IPv6 natively backbone. So the trick what we are using here is that we are going to be encoding the 32-bit sits in a UDP header. So that actually means that UDP can travel over v4 and UDP can travel over IPv6. So let's, uh, so the principle actually used is that we will be doing like um, encoding them in the same way as we would be encoding them in, in MPLS, but we're gonna be putting the MPLS, you know, the sit itself into the UDP header itself. So, Let's have a look how it looks like. So this is how it looks like. So first, if we start doing that, then the outer header is either IPv4 or IPv6, and then based on the protocol, you're gonna be imposing like 20 bytes or 40 bytes uh, overhead. Then we have our UDP header, which is eight bytes. And then we're gonna have like 32 bits per sit instead of 128. And then potentially to add some additional context, we may or may not add some network services header. So if you now compare the IPv6, uh, so the 128-bit SIT solution and the 32-bit solution over native IPv4 or native IPv6, it looks like this. So even though it is sort of like, you know, they're like different, if you look into the way it is encoded, it is actually very similar, just the fields and the headers are like kind of like placed in a different location. So in the SRV6 world, we actually have our fixed IPv6 40 byte header, which is gonna be the tunnel header. In the SR over UDP world, we actually, we have our tunnel header here, 
which can be either v4 20 bytes or can be v6 40 bytes. Then we actually have like our so segment routing header extension header, you know, the fixed part eight bytes. Well, guess what? UDP header is eight bytes also. Similar thing. And then on top of that, in here, in the 128 bits, we actually we impose a sequence of 128 bit sits. In the SR of UDP, we actually impose a set of a sequence of 32 bit sits. That's what we see here. So, so looking at it from that perspective, it is actually very similar. So now if we actually go further, and we start to look into, okay, you know, Gunter, you speak about this as or over UDP thing, is it actually as powerful? Well, originally when Azure v6 was developed, they actually, you know, we actually made a plan and we described the use cases for IPv6 source routing in networking and actually described like a whole set of different use cases. So if you actually look into what these solutions can do, they actually both comply 100% to this particular document. So both of them are equal. So it really depends upon your use case and your, you know, and, 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 and your problem you're trying to solve as an operator, which one to choose. Yeah? I'm not telling you which one is the best, I'm just giving you some considerations here. So looking into, just comparing them again, and that is another data point what you can use. So again, looking into our pay, you know, base payload packet here of 500 bytes, if you, would add like three different sits, uh, three, if you would impose three sits you know, onto, upon the packet itself, then in the SRV6 world with 128 bits, that actually would mean 11.2% overhead tax. And in the SR of UDP world, that actually would mean about like 4% of overhead. So it's really up to you which solution you want to use. Do you want to add the 7% you know, overhead tax, yes or no? Totally up to you. I'm just comparing them. Then the fourth evolution of what we're seeing is what's what we call like the seamless kind of environment where you actually have the capability, I'm going to go pretty quickly over this slide here, where we actually have the capability for going from MPLS data plane to IPv4 data plane to IPv6 data plane in a seamless kind of solution. So that is something, you know, what we know actually, you know, are, you know, can help you with. And we actually, you know, Basically what we're doing, we're sort of like stitching domains together and making the 32-bit segment routing seamless going over all these different kind of environments over all these type of data planes. So how do we conclude this? So from what we have seen until this point in time is that the you know, segment routing over MPLS eh, and that the segment routing over UDP is seems to be a reasonable fit for brownfield network environments where you already have existing technology in the field and you would like to simplify your network environment and you would, add, you would like to add the capability of programmability. So that seems to be the sweet spot here. Uh, Azure v6 uh, is actually very interesting because you can actually add some additional degree of context about the packet, you can actually add some additional programmability in the 128-bit, you know, uh, set of what you have available, so that is actually very nice. Uh, but the sad thing is that it will only work over an, a native IPv6 data plane, so unless you as an operator are native IPv6 only, this is going to be a not-so-trivial migration, so just be aware of that. You know, on, you know, in addition, you know, imposing a set, you know, imposing a big uh, set of sits, you know, and imposing a big, you know, over, you know, imposing a bit, a big encapsulation itself is also not so trivial from a hardware, you know, ASIC perspective, independent of which venture you go to. So the question actually is, you know, really good country, you know, but why do I still then hear, you know, people speak about SRV6 if the overhead actually, you know, is so much and if, you, and if one actually is then only for V6 and the other one is actually more for brownfield kind of network environments? Well, the very nice property of SRV6 is that it provides you a more tight coupling between underlay and overlay, which can be very useful if you want to stitch networks together from one end to the other end. So if you look into what SRV6 is providing you with from a beneficial property, it gives you two, you know, mass, you know, two massive uh, benefits here. One, because of the source routing header, you have very good awareness of, you know, at any point in the network where the, where the packet actually has been in the past, 
where you are right now, where the packet will go to. With MPLS, you don't really have that, eh? because with MPLS, as far as the packet goes through the network, each time you remove an MPLS label, you remove one, you remove one, you lose the tracking of the packet. The second thing what you have as a benefit with Azure v6 is that you don't really need to have or to construct these funky mapping tables between labels and IP addresses and locations. So that is a good thing because 128-bit segments can look and actually they have made them look the same as IPv6 addresses. So you don't need those mapping tables anymore. So those are big, nice properties. Now the sad thing about SRV6 is the overhead tax which is imposed. So this actually drove the IETF to say, okay, you know, we like these beneficial properties of like having a more close relationship between underlay and overlay. That's really nice. So, but we don't really like the tax so much. So how can we actually reduce the overhead imposed by this SRV6 paradigm? And they've been working on a, on a set of solutions. And right now, it's kind of like a big mess out there because there are like many solutions out there. Now, the, the thing to remember from this also, from these different solutions, is that they are not perfect. They actually compromise on some of the initial basic principles of, IPv, of, of SRV6. Some of them actually give up uh, some of the, the tr tracking uh, of where the packet actually has been to, and, all, and others actually give up on the simplicity because you still, you know, maybe you need to have like these mapping tables again between a SIT and a particular location in the network. So let's have a look into where we are. So I discovered four at this point in time, and they actually each compromise on a different uh, component here. So the first one is something what is dealing with what, what they have called like unified identifiers. So in this case, they actually say like, okay, we like to have these 32-bit segments, but with MPLS, we, we, we lose the, f so this is actually kind of like the odd one here. Eh? So with MPLS, you, ha you have the nice benefit of having short sits, but you will lose if the packet traverses through the network the tracking of the packet, because each time you, know, you go through a hop of the SIT, you remove the label and then you lose the tracking. So what you will do with Unified Identifier is you actually are upgrading the source routing header for inserting all of these different types of SITs. So they actually reuse the original you know, source routing header from traditional SRV6. They hijack some of the flags fields in there and they suppose uh, and they actually impose like different values to it. So in there, they actually have like a different flag saying like all the seats in there are 32 bits and another flag actually says like all the seats are like 20 bits and or like IPv6 addresses and then another one is like, you know, all the seats in there are like IPv4 addresses. The second one is something what is making uh, which is reducing the size of SITs being used. So what you are doing here is something what is called they're compressing the 128-bit SITs into 16-bit SITs or 32-bit SITs. So what you are doing is they are creating a separation between the transport of the packet through the network and the services that are going to be imposed upon those packets. So by doing that, they sort of like bring back the the principle of what you're doing at MPLS. So the location, like an IPv6 address, for example, yeah? so an, like an IPv6 address, is going to be reflected by a 32-bit SIT. So in this case, by doing this, you need to go back to what MPLS actually was. Yeah? You need to have like these mapping tables again, and that is why it's called like SR, you know, SR mapping, you know, uh, IPv6. It's because you map a 32-bit SIT or a 16-bit SIT into an IPv6 address, so you need to create these mapping uh, tables again. But the nice you know, benefit of this particular solution is that you have a clear separation between transport seats and the service seats that need to happen. And you can actually do this you know, uh, serviceability per segment, or you can do a, you know, uh, a service for the path itself. Then the third solution is you know, what they have come up with is something what is called like the micro sets. So in this case, each micro sit is like a, like a 
a mini program what is run upon the network, you know, upon the packet. And the mini program could be like, okay, send a packet towards a particular destination or send a packet into a layer two VPN or a layer three VPN. So the way it is working is that the segments in this case are, you know, carved up in a different kind of a way. So the way MicroSwitch is working is first you actually, you have a carrier which is always going to be the same and then the SIT, what is imposed in a segment routing header, is what you see on the back here. And then each time, the packet gets routed towards, so this, if this would be IPv6, so this would be like 16 bits, 32 bits, this would be like 48 bits. So you're gonna be like doing shorter spot routing towards the slash 48 to a particular node. So this actually works very well. So at the moment it comes at the node, it actually takes up you know, the packet itself, it goes to the next hop, and actually it removes this sit, and then it removes the rest, one shot forward, and you put like zero, zero, zero at the back. So that is, it's like a shift operation. This works pretty well, works well for hardware. There is a cost to this. It does not come for free, because it does burn up address space in IPv6. Each node, each sit will burn up one slash 48. And remember, in IPv6 we had like a lot of addresses while doing this, you will burn. So this is the, the third proposal, what is in ITF right now. Yeah, so everything is a compromise. And then the, the fourth proposal of what I've seen is what is called like the compressed SRV6 network programming. So what, so this actually is a proposal which is, has been relatively dormant at this point in time. I don't really see a lot of traction on this particular idea anymore. Uh, I just put it into the deck here for completeness. So what the concept here is that, like if you look into an IPv6 address, what you see here, then within a particular operator, you will actually have like a common part in the beginning of your prefix, which could be like the IPv6 assigned prefix for your organization. And then per node, you're gonna have like a variable part. And with the compromised uh, source routing header, what you're going to be doing is to actually add this variable part as a sequence of sits in a new type of source routing header. That's what you're doing there. Again, it's a compromise. And then of course, just to make sure that, you know, that these four solutions are not you know, confusing enough, in the beginning of like the middle of last month, another proposal popped up you know, out of the woodwork, a fifth one, <laughs> um, which actually has to do with like, uh, like variable length sits. So in this case, what you can do is independent of, you can actually have the free selection to choose any size of sit of what you want. You tell you know, the programmability engine you know, in, in the routing here, what is going to be your fixed part from before and all the rest you're going to be programming back to back in the S or H uh, framework itself. So again, this is actually very new. It's very brand new out. This will be discussed at the next IETF. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are gonna be like some heavy debates in here because we have, you know, they're like in IETF, like a few vocal people. Many of them do have some serious operational concerns, so I'm pretty sure it will keep uh, Warren very busy also at the IETF. <laughs> I don't wanna be in issues. <laughs> uh, but that is where we are right now. Eh? So from, so coming back into my talk because I'm at the end of my slot here, if you look into the evolution of where segment routing is and where it will be, what we have seen until now is that it actually has been very successful with 32-bit segments. And 32-bit segments can go over MPLS data plane, can go over V4 data plane, can go over IPv6 data plane. If you go for 128-bit segments, you actually you are tied to an IPv6 only environment, which may or may not work for you. Most networks I know of have like at least some sort of a mix. We have some rare ones with actually RV6 only. And then, because of the property, what SRV6 actually offers you is a more tight coupling between the underlay and the underlay, underlay and the overlay. Uh, some ideas are being built up or brewed up right now in the standardization body, how to reduce the overhead tax by compromising, you know, the solutions itself. Uh, so that is where we are, you know, at this point in time, uh, unless I have a question. Uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, no, it's very, uh, very much a serendipity that I managed to uh, sit in uh, on this talk. I was uh, just uh, chatting with my friend uh, Bui here from EdgeCore. Uh, my name is Randy Fitton. I, I work for Nobiflow. I run the uh, Asia region here, and I just happen to be ex Nokia. So, um, and, and I just kind of wanted to highlight on, on all of the things that you were saying. We're currently working with Daniel Bernier in Bell Canada, implementing the SRV6 on the uh, Edge Core based Tofino platform. So, we're right in the middle of this discussion. I think uh, Daniel will be uh, talking a little bit about the kind of project that we have uh, that's, uh, that's going on. You know, this, uh, I, I won't, uh, I also won't say either side what's the best way to do this, but there's um, a lot of exciting uh, work that's going to be announced in 2020. And, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's a very uh, interesting area and, and where this is going to go. We're doing service chaining as well as the yeah. uh, segment routing, so all good. Thanks. So. Thank you. I'm not sure if you have time for more questions or? Any other questions or a comment? No? Uh, I have one simple question. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> uh, I'm a president uh, committee of April 2020. So uh, we have uh, some presentation of uh, segment routing from multiple network vendors. So uh, I'd like to know if uh, there are uh, network operators already using segment routing testing or thinking to start introduce uh, please raise your hand if you do it oh some people is here so thank you so uh if you have a knowledge or a use case please uh, apply uh, next uh, april court or uh, epic meeting so please so warren kamari google so back in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were people doing IPv4 source routing. And that turned into a huge security issue and fairly much everybody blocks it. This feels very similar to bringing that back. I mean, when you're doing MPLS, you at least have a clear border between where the edge of one domain is and the other. And you don't do cross-domain MPLS because that just always ends badly. There's a lot of things here where the edge of the domain is not clearly defined. And I suspect we're going to have the exact same set of problems we did with v4 source routing, where people will direct packets to you with a you know, set of segments to follow, and now they can route happily where you don't want them to. Um, many of the spring discussions sort of gloss over that fact, and that kind of concerns me. Um, this one as well sort of didn't mention the how you deal with packets coming in with SIDs from outside. Yeah, so. So indeed, it's an important aspect here. So that particular problem space, you know, where you actually potentially, you know, me as a malicious entity, for example, or by accident, sent a source routed packet to my neighbor, which could cause like a reflection kind of attack. It's not a very good thing eh? in the IPv4 world with source routing. That actually is blocked. Any packet with a source routing header, block, block, block at the edge. Now you open up your edge, and initially, what you will find actually in the SRV6 uh, RFC, is it? Yes, an RFC now, I think. Yeah. Uh, so that's the reason actually they put in this, uh, this HMAC thing. But I, I honestly think it is more, you know, uh, yeah, this operational HMAC. So that is the idea. So if you get a packet in, you want to make sure that the guy sending it to you is actually the, not a spoofer, but is like the real guy. And the HMAC gives you like a tool to actually, you know, verify this. Now, this sounds like very nice from a theoretical perspective, but the reality is if you need to do a HMAC verification on every freaking packet you get in, you're in for a mess, huh? your router will burn down. So I don't think that will happen at all. So I expect until, you know, until I hear better that as of V6 will be just within a local region and not really into the main or anything like that. And it is an open topic for security debate. It's still ongoing. It is unknown. Security implications with 32 bits are very well known because the, you know, the area between the MPLS world and the IP world is very, very well delimited. With SRV6, you're open. It's unknown what you will be opening up your network to. So yes, it's, it's definitely a topic for concern. Hi, uh, Mark Smith from the Internet Society. A um, few things to remember. Number one is when you use a protocol, 
um, it's not directed you, but it's arguably directed the Spring Working Group. When you use a protocol, it means you can't just go fast and loose and change what you like. And Spring, in a lot of those proposals, like you said and everything else, they're saying we're going to encode a lot of different things in the destination address. It becomes multiple destinations encoded in the field that's clearly defined as a destination address. RFC 8200, which is the IPv6 spec, is a standard, a full internet standard now. Um, so the, the, one of the reasons to try to use IPv6 is because it's a commodity protocol. But the moment you start changing it, you decommodify it, and then you have to forklift upgrade your network. So um, th these debates are going on. Um, the other thing, which, which partly ties to what you were saying, IPv6 is actually an internetworking protocol to network networks. And the reason why the addresses are so large is because everything is. In fact, technically, there's more SIDs available in your local network than there are in the entirety of IPv6 addresses for the world, for the internet, for the rest of the time. So I, I would say this, if you get a vendor who comes up and says, here's our version of SR, which does IPv6, but we play fast and loose, we change the meaning of fields and everything else, just realise that all the commodity value you, you're supposed to be getting from using IPv6 is going out the window, and you'll forklift upgrade your network and, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> you can see my, uh, my draft and um, presentation from IPv106 if you want to. One of, the, one of the things that wasn't covered here was the insertion of EHs, which is a really, really bad idea. Okay, that's it. Okay, no, that's good. Okay, okay uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Gunther. <laughs> so, uh, next talk is Towards Our Open Edge Future by San Yang from Tesla. Okay, good morning. So uh, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Sunny, I work in Telstra. I've been here for, uh, I've been in Telstra for about 14 years, uh, previously doing wireless, uh, and uh, for the last three years uh, doing uh, something very unique, which I'll be talking about today. Um, so over the last uh, two years, uh, we've been actually doing a planning role for uh, building a common uh, NFV infrastructure based on open standards. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about why we did this, uh, how it works and what it's like to actually operate. And uh, we'll also be uh, looking at adopting the methodology uh, for emerging technologies uh, when we start deploying into the edge environment as well. So why did we actually do this? First of all, there are way too many uh, bespoke company uh, solutions within the company uh, for cloud and different products. So uh, we needed to uh, look at whether or not there was a strategy we could uh, develop uh, or a platform we can actually develop to build a common hosting infrastructure for network functions that we wanted to virtualize in order to reduce our costs. And we wanted to also simplify uh, our network architecture to remove any complexity uh, and introduce uh, new functions uh, t uh, and services and uh, introduce things like uh, service function chaining and improve the overall uh, resiliency and redundancy uh, for our network functions as well when we virtualize them. So uh, we started this journey uh, by establishing a few principles uh, with our architecture. I'm not going to go through all of these, you can read them yourselves as well, but I'll, I'll focus on one or two uh, and talk a little bit about uh, them as well. Uh, the first one I want to have a closer look at here is um, network and virtual, networking and virtualization based on open architecture and common technology standards. We wanted to start moving away from reliance on a roadmap dictated by uh, traditional vendors uh, and wanted to start looking at how we can incorporate the best functions from the vendors that are focused on those particular functions and only deploy those functions. Uh, it's a way to try and reduce our overall cost, reduce the overall operational uh, requirements uh, from, uh, from our uh, platform, um, and uh, moving forward, simplify our operations. We also looked at number 
uh, four here, the drive the architecture towards inclusion of container-based virtualization. So number four there is something that the industry has been moving towards uh, over the last few years. We've been, very, we've been starting very slowly with monolithic VMs at the moment uh, in OpenStack, but uh, slowly but surely moving towards uh, container-based uh, solutions for our network functions. Um, that's something that has been uh, driven uh, primarily over the last few years by enterprise, um, but uh, slowly but surely it's moving towards network functions as well. Uh, we wanted to, uh, number 10 there, uh, we wanted to ensure that the infrastructure would support a multi-tenancy design catering for a centralised and a decentralised model. Um, and uh, moving, moving a little bit away from the technology, uh, number 12 there, we wanted to make sure we had a multi-skilled centre of ex excellence. So we needed internal expertise, uh, we have external expertise assisting us. Um, and overall, Telstra was uh, becoming the, uh, uh, the systems integrator uh, for this particular platform. So our journey. Uh, so on the left there, we have where we were. So we were used to uh, deploying physical appliances for many, many years, as uh, most carriers have been. Uh, we started virtualizing uh, functions themselves, but uh, still within uh, a, a dedicated infrastructure. Uh, after that, we started having many, many vertical VNFs coupled one-to-one -one with uh, environments. So we have multiple infrastructure environments, basically. And what we've been trying to achieve and what we are now at is to have a common NFV infrastructure to host virtual network functions. Um, the next step uh, is obviously to make it even more open. So what we want to do here is have loosely coupled hardware and software components based on open standards and completely make it completely layered and open. So, uh, key features of this architecture, and I'll, I won't read through all of it, but we wanted to start disassociating hardware as software. I'll talk a little bit about that in, the next, in my next, next slide. Uh, we obviously wanted to ensure separation of control and data planes, um, so SDN has been deployed in it. Uh, virtualization and containerization of virtual functions. Uh, we wanted also program programmatic control of the network and resources um, with orchestration, uh, ensuring that it remains standardized and we're not using proprietary protocols. Um, and a lot of automation has also been deployed into it as well. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Okay. So, um, we started disaggregating our network infrastructure. Um, so, uh, older ways of working is we have basically a vendor that would supply both the hardware and the software uh, for a particular network uh, device. And we started moving towards a white box solution where we would pick the hardware that we wanted, um, that had the functions that we wanted, uh, and not only that, we also picked our own network operating system that we wanted as well. And by doing that, we could purchase hardware that was required for the functions that we needed uh, while keeping the software consistent, and then we can just replace the hardware. Or vice versa, uh, if we like the hardware and we wanted a new operating system, uh, we would simply just replace the operating system and maintain the existing hardware. So what that does is breaks us from a reliance on uh, using a, uh, a single vendor's roadmap and allow us to dictate our own future moving forward. Uh, it's all standards-based, as I mentioned previously. So we're using very standard um, networking-based protocols at this stage. Um, it is uh, within a spine leaf architecture, um, so uh, very traditional data center type of protocols, VXLAN over EVPN. Uh, we're using BGP unnumbered, which is a little bit different. Uh, and it's all dual stacked. 
So using white box means that we also skip the sticker. We actually uh, can work directly with the manufacturer if so wanted, uh, which makes things significantly cheaper as well. And we can, as I mentioned before, we can use an operating system uh, with only the features that we want and we can uh, eliminate uh, protocols or uh, uh, functions that we don't actually really need in the operating system as well. Uh, it's also perpetually licensed, which means we pay it once and, and that's it. We pay, uh, we pay possibly an annual uh, maintenance fee, but um, you pay it once and that's it. Um, so the networking hardware is basically a commodity now, um, just like computes. Uh, you can uh, change them out every few years um, without, uh, with, without much issue. And everything is 100 gig uh, day one in our uh, infrastructure. So uh, to create such a, create an open infrastructure like this, uh, there's lots of different components to it. And we had to operate this with multiple vendors uh, at the same time. Um, so I'm not going to list out all the vendors here, but uh, just to give you an idea, these are, there's seven different vendors uh, or providers that are providing equipment or functions for us to actually build this open infrastructure. So we have something to build a provider to provide us the VIM, the SDN components, the hardware for the compute, uh, the hardware for the networking, the operating system for the networking, the resource orchestration, the service orchestration. Um, some are the same, but uh, this, they're mainly all different. And the challenge for us as planners uh, to deploy something like this is to actually not just design it, but also how to operate it, and also ensure that um, the vendors are actually working with each other. So it's it's a, it's a big challenge. So the VIM uh, interacting with the SDN is, is one thing that we've looked very, uh, we've, ha we've had experience with uh, through this uh, platform. So that's one of the challenges uh, that we've experienced. Uh, the SDN uh, solution interacting with the underlay network because it's using a different vendor solution. Uh, the resource orchestration interacting with the VIM. The OpenStack uh, discussion versus containers um, uh, and Kubernetes. Uh, tenant network segmentation using containers. These are some of the challenges that we're currently facing. I won't have time today to go through all of them, but um, these are what we're facing at the moment. There's also a heavy reliance on uh, services, skills, and products uh, available commercially. Uh, developing the skills internally, uh, is it, it takes time. Uh, although the skill set is very, very good uh, and developing over time internally, uh, we're still very reliant on our vendors to provide those services and expertise to us. So participation in communities, uh, we've been participating in a lot of communities um, that are relating to the orchestration, the SDN, Kubernetes, etc., um, to basically ensure that the future roadmap of this uh, continues and uh, the solution basically continues to adhere to open standards as well. And we're avoiding any uh, use of proprietary technologies uh, where possible. And yeah, we're just keeping updates on products as we're going forward. So uh, I want to share some challenges, uh, other challenges that we've got in a little bit more detail as well. Um, as we're moving towards this open ecosystem, um, three of these, these are three of the more major ones that we've encountered. The first one is a V-router. The V-router is basically replacing our OVS uh, in this open uh, architecture. Uh, and has implications interacting with the underlay. So the vRouter function doesn't actually understand or see the underlay network whatsoever. It's all encapsulated. So the visibility of it, it becomes very difficult. So we actually had to build visibility both for the underlay and the overlay and create a systematic process to actually uh, analyze the both of them. There's no particular industry solution to solve that at this point. Uh, gateway termination, we're using a particular SDN solution that uses a GRE encapsulation over the underlay, uh, which means that the gateway actually needs to terminate both the underlay and the overlay before the traffic exits the network. Um, so the gateway itself, the selection of the gateway is very, very important because it needs to terminate both uh, GRE encapsulated traffic and underlay uh, VXLAN over eVPN as well. So it needs, to, it needs to be able to do that but then it needs to also segregate the traffic. It needs to understand how to separate underlay and overlay traffic. 
Um, so that's also an issue uh, that we've, uh, we've solved, um, but we've also been facing uh, through, uh, throughout the deployment. Next one's an automated deployment. So automated, automated deployments, it's separate from the Vim platform deployment. So you have to deploy a Vim in order to run your data center. Um, we're, we've been running OpenStack initially, um, but which comes first? So do you deploy the network first? Do, or do you deploy the Vim first? Without the Vim, you don't have a network. Um, which comes first. So, so that's been a bit of a, uh, a little bit of a challenge at the starting points of this. Um, and uh, what, how do we actually, uh, how does it actually affect each other if one of them goes down? And how do we actually fix it? Uh, and who's ultimately responsible for it from a vendor perspective? So ultimately, we we got to a point where uh, when a Vim is actually deployed, initially it would have to be the network, and it's going to be manual. But when everything is actually deployed, the Vim would actually just deploy uh, network configurations automatically afterwards anywhere uh, within our network um, uh, for our MPLS core. Um, so the question really is, we really got to start with the network and it's all manual at the start and it took a little bit of time. Um, but uh, once the Vim platform's up, automation becomes fairly simple. So who, what is it like to operate here? So we've been using DevOps uh, for engineering and operations. It's a combined effort, uh, one single uh, group that is both doing engineering and operations at the same time. And they work very closely with each other. Um, and operations is, uh, has to be included in all aspects of the implementation and also in architecture design as well. So we established that baseline once, uh, once all the vendors came in together to create this open architecture and went through a Formica um, and standardized process to establish uh, what happens, for example, if a NIC card fails, um, who's actually responsible. And we needed to be the liais liaison between all the different vendors when issues do arise. Uh, it's, a, it's a very new way of working uh, through these type of platforms, so we don't actually know how to actually do it when we started. It's a, it was a big learning process uh, over the last two years for us. Um, so we try to eliminate any finger pointing as much as possible in these type of meetings uh, when we try to resolve issues, uh, when issues do actually arise. Um, so a standard operating process is documented um, so that we don't need to repeat those exercises uh, as we move forward. Uh, another big one is we identified major vendors that we can work with. So there are you know, some functions we've actually uh, found smaller vendors that can actually do the functions better than the major vendors. Um, but if a major vendor or a, ma uh, or a support uh, company can actually help us uh, in certain situations, we've actually got the major company um, to go through um, the process, the operating process uh, on our behalf so that uh, they can represent the smaller vendors uh, instead of us having to deal with everyone all, all at the same time. So that's all great, and that was what we actually did over the last two years. And uh, actually, the previ previous presentation led leads us to, well, what's next? Because we built this open platform. It's still fairly new in the industry, but as you can see already, it's using technology that is rather complex and layered. So it will probably operate for a few more years, but moving forward, there needs to be a major change because as it becomes more virtualized and you introduce more microservices, there's going to be more things that are going to be introduced in industry. So it's not a full list, but these are things that we've been interested in uh, moving forward. Uh, container networking is well known. The next one is programmable smart fabrics. And uh, we want to do this because we wanted to make sure there's more intelligence and uh, more control over how we actually uh, deploy services for our customers. Uh, SmartNIC, uh, offloading more functions onto a SmartNIC and utilizing uh, the resources on there to do more. Uh, we want to do control user plane separation as part of 5G. Uh, user functions offload, offloading the user plane onto a, uh, onto a switch fabric itself. We need to look at global orchestration, service mesh, cloud native applications, and uh, the last one's really hard, uh, real-time end-to-end telemetry monitoring and reporting. Uh, the last one especially uh, if you want to do uh, full loop automation. So 
big application for this is edge compute. Uh, in edge compute, there's restrictive, especially in Australia, uh, we have to look at restrictive power supply, restrictive real estate, and we need to optimize what's actually available. So using some of these technologies becomes very, very important for us. Things like a smart NIC, offloading some functions onto a smart NIC instead of using the compute's own CPU and memory resources, offloading the user function onto the, uh, onto the programmable smart fabric, uh, free up even more compute so that you can onboard more consumer and enterprise functions uh, for providing services to your customers. Uh, so yeah, these become very, very important moving forward. But how do we actually do that? If you look at the left diagram on there, um, our platform that we're building, the open platform that we're building, is essentially on a, on a spoke. If you look at it, um, there's a lot of tromboning of traffic going on. Uh, and what we need to do is find a way so that traffic coming from the access network doesn't necessarily have to go in and out, in and out, or traverse a single point to actually go elsewhere in the network. So the cord architecture is something we've been looking very closely at as a next generation architecture we can actually move to. Uh, CORD stands for central office, re-architected as a data center. Um, central office is an American term for an exchange in Australia. And moving forward, what we want to do is make sure everything is actually in line with the network so that there's no tromboning whatsoever. So the access network is basically connected at the edge uh, to, um, to the same network elements, physical network elements, that are connected to the virtual elements that it's connected to. So basically the traffic would just go in and out, and that's it. So the virtualized services become in line with the traffic flow, and you simplify the exit point with a virtualized gateway. Um, don't even need a gateway anymore to traverse different domains. Uh, one thing about this is what protocol do we actually use? And uh, this leads on very well from the previous discussion around SRV6 and pro programmable smart fabrics. So it's still a big question mark to whether or not we will deploy SRV6 in uh, architecture such as this, uh, but it certainly uh, has a lot of ticks uh, behind it uh, in, uh, in, if, if put in that context. So how does it relate to Edge? Um, the open ecosystem together with Cord suddenly allows us to create something very unique. So we've got video analytics, public safety, IoT that are possible edge use cases. When you put uh, the edge compute uh, within the Cord architecture, suddenly you can push certain services instead of going to the public cloud or to an enterprise cloud sitting behind a service provider at a remote location, or a more centralized location, I should say, you can actually push some of those workloads directly next to um, the uh, access network so that it's significantly closer to your customer. What that does is just uh, introduce uh, significantly lower latency for your services and also uh, more compute uh, possibilities uh, for your customers to do things that may not be possible today. Um, so uh, it's still early days. Uh, we're still looking at different applications, um, but uh, certainly the ones listed there are all possible uh, things that are, can occur for edge networks. So I wanted to just share this final slide. So where did we come from? So in 2016, I did a presentation at Apricot as well, um, and we talked about the things that were listed there. SDN can be used for service chaining and monitoring. Uh, we should be using NFVI for lower impact uh, network elements. Uh, we should begin virtualization in control plane functions. And uh, large physical investments shouldn't be disrupted until the risks of a virtual deployment is reduced. Well, realistically, nothing's changed much all right, over the last four years. The industry's been moving very, very slowly, um, but for good reason. So I can tell you here today, um, we are looking slowly at transitioning SDN to pro programmable smart fabrics uh, and whether or not that's going to be more of a trend in the next three to five years and how that is going to contribute to uh, the industry, we don't know yet. 
uh, but uh, it should be used for all network functions in NFE. Uh, something slightly different, we think that NFE I should be used for all network functions now. There, there is no reason for a physical appliance anymore. Uh, the centralization of the control plane in, uh, is already on its way and we need to start pushing the user plane closer to the customers. So offload is something that's fairly uh, a fairly new and radical idea, but it is something that we're very interested in. And uh, in the future, uh, the SDN environment is already extending to SD-WAN, obviously, but we need to adopt something like an end-to-end -end label to create end-to-end -end services uh, moving forward. So is SRV6 something that will support that? We don't know yet. Uh, it's certainly something we're investigating. Uh, we absolutely do need to in, uh, look at adopting cord moving forward, I believe, um, but uh, uh, we'll see how that goes. And uh, pushing the user plane off uh, onto the switch fabric, I believe, is going to be monumentally important to ensure that we can use the compute for providing actual services to our customers instead of just for network functions internally. And looking at a combination of CUPS, smart NICs, programmable smart fabrics offload, uh, removing all the physical equipment is definitely something uh, that we're looking at moving forward. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Ah, Tom, some, please. Oh, Tom's running up. <laughs> Hi, uh, Tom Paseka from Cloudflare. In the core design, you showed edge compute um, in, inside the telephone exchange. Um, I know with Cord that that's planning on being inside of the telco's IP space, but are you thinking of actually bringing BGP to those points as well? Um, at this point, um, I think in the early days probably yes, but moving forward, I believe we should be pushing SRV6 not only through the, to the network functions themselves, but into the kernel itself. If we can do that, that means that we've got a true end-to-end -end visibility of uh, the user. And uh, we can utilize that uh, to our advantage uh, for things like service function chaining moving forward. But let's see what happens. I mean, it's still early days, but um, as the uh, adoption of SRV6 uh, grows over the next few years um, or months, um, uh, vendors are gonna start implementing that technology in their operating system. It's not happening with everyone just yet. Until that point, there is no choice but BGP, so. Any other comment or questions? I have one question yes, for you. Sure. So uh, you mentioned that uh, your network is moving to this aggregated network, right? Sorry. Uh, uh, your nation is moving to this aggregated network, yes. right? So, uh, we have uh, some options uh, about network OS. So uh, do you have any preference uh, between uh, open source and uh, a product uh, from network vendors? Um, I think open source is, very, is the direction that we're trying to head towards, um, but the important thing to think about is whether or not your company actually has enough developers. And for most telecommunications companies or smaller companies, that's a big difficulty. So what we've been trying to do is try and build a more hybrid model. So we're, we're kind of leaning towards open source, but we're looking for vendors that are embracing open source and willing to become the developer. So uh, it's a hybrid model. So I support both. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? So uh, please applaud the speakers. <laughs> the uh, third uh, talk is, can we a pure software approach router uh, from Yasuhiro Oha-san from Entity Communications? Hi, my name is uh, Hi, my name is Yasuhiro Hara. Uh, I'm uh, developing a software router uh, 
and this is the presentation about the uh, software well. So there is a, a very uh, high-speed efficient uh, library that is called DBDK, and uh, uh, using the DBDK library, uh, we can build uh, a very high-speed software router. And uh, our version uh, is uh, kind of uh, unique in that we have built a, a, a custom uh, routing lookup algorithm uh, that is called PopTry. This part, and uh, uh, we can attach it to the FRL, so the uh, we can run uh, OSPF or BGP uh, using this software router, and uh, it's capable of full uh, BGP routing. It's gonna be uh, 800,000 routes in the IPv4 right now, and yeah, uh, it's capable. So uh, for the performance, uh, we tested uh, in this environment. Uh, there is, a, you know, Spirant. Uh, there is a, a very expensive uh, network tester, and that is uh, connected back to back uh, to our uh, software called Kami. This is the device under <laughs> test, and uh, they are connected. Uh, in four uh, 100G uh, link, Ethernet link. And uh, on, on them, uh, you know, 90 gigabps uh, random destination traffic is inject, injected from the spirant. And uh, we uh, also inject the full routing table uh, two years back, uh, full routing table uh, to the BGP from this spirant to the Kami. And, the traffic, uh, 360 gigabps traffic is shuffled according to the full routing table and back to the spirant. Uh, so the, how, how much uh, traffic the spirant could uh, receive was the performance that the company could uh, forward. And this is the performance. You know, uh, uh, when the uh, size of the traffic, I mean the size of the packets in the traffic is uh, more than uh, 50, uh, uh, 500 uh, bytes or uh, bigger, then the, it, it is an uh, easy task for a router because, you know, the number of packets in the uh, seconds is lower. So uh, if we put the four cores per port, then the, uh, you know, uh, fi uh, 500 uh, bytes or larger size traffic is, uh, you know, easily forwarded above the 300 gigabps. But when it comes to the uh, short up uh, packets, you know, uh, it's very difficult for software router to uh, forward the traffic, so uh, you know, the performance is lower on the four core per port. Uh, it's gonna be like uh, 50 gigabps or so, and uh, it can <coughs> be said still. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, good number, you know. Uh, when uh, you talking about the software router, it's gonna be you know, uh, multiple tens of uh, gigabps couldn't be uh, forwarded in uh, two or three years back, but uh, you know, uh, we can right now. And uh, if we are uh, putting more hardware resources on the hardware, uh, I mean the forwarding uh, task, then the, even in the uh, shortest uh, traffic, shortest uh, Ethernet frame traffic, we could, um, we can uh, forward uh, 200, uh, gigabps, which is uh, three, 300 million pps. <coughs> so this is, this is a transformation of the x-axis, and so uh, if you want the uh, 
this type of performance, then uh, four core per port is uh, sufficient for your application. But uh, if you need uh, this uh, performance, then you would you can uh, uh, assign the 12 core per port. So uh, there is a four port in our uh, testing environment. So the all the 48 cores are uh, dedicated to the forwarding task, and you get this uh, performance. So this is the you know internal structure of uh, our software about Akami, and uh, basically you know it's a scale out of uh, the uh, traffic forwarding onto the CPU cores. So these are the four others, and you can uh, set up as many as uh, four others, as long as the, there is a CPU core. And uh, we, you know, uh, the, there is a kind of uh, distinction from uh, Linux space and the DBDK space. And so if you attach the, uh, if you use the NIC in the DBDK, then the Linux, uh, is basically doesn't see that NIC. But uh, we uh, bridge those, uh, you know, the common software router bridges. And uh, there is a top device that is uh, map mapped one to one uh, in the Linux space so that the, you know, Quagga or FRL, the BGP daemon can recognize uh, the traffic that is coming through this NIC through here. And uh, the FRL BGPD can uh, calculate the routes and uh, install it in the Linux uh, routing table. That is <coughs> uh, delivered to, uh, through the Netlink socket to us. And we, uh, we use uh, the routing table, BGP routing, uh, in the forwarding, <coughs> in our forwarding process. So, uh, so far, uh, we have uh, kind of <coughs> two use cases we uh, are using right now. One is the uh, in the university. Uh, one one university uh, wants to migrate to the IPv6, and uh, but they don't want to touch the. <coughs> original IPv4 campus network, so the, uh, they additionally use our uh, software router. Oh. Uh. <coughs> and, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you PC, uh, on, uh, we installed the Kami on the One UPC, and uh, it uh, it is handling the full BZP route. It's a kind of you know cheaper version of the co uh, BZP core router. It's about uh, five thousand USD for the uh, One U <coughs> One UPC server, so uh, it's uh, kind of uh, cheap. It's running uh, for six months right now, so. Uh, we could say it's stable right now. And the other use case is uh, multicast router. And uh, we are using the uh, uh, Supermicro uh, high-end server uh, with the uh, uh, four 100G NIC from the Nolanox. And uh, used, uh, it contributes the uh, multicast uh, streaming event. That is the Sapporo Snow Festival 2020. That's uh, one or one month back. You know, uh, in the uh, north part of the Japan, uh, we built uh, uh, the very large statue of ice, and uh, our event is uh, the objective of our events is to uh, uh, distribute the 8K. Uh, uh, video uh, on the IP network uh, and uh, 
uh, to the nationwide uh, IP network. And uh, this year was kind of uh, challenging, and um, there is a two uh, 8K uh, video, and uh, through the different network, it is uh, delivered to the some uh, public viewing sites, and uh, it is, uh, you know, make it as a 3D. So the, uh, you know, uh, this is the 3D glasses, and uh, there is a two, you know, L and R uh, uh, 3D, and you know, you can uh, get the 3D image in the 8K, you know, uh, size. So this is the, you know, uh, the organizations that's uh, uh, involved in the event. And uh, the NICT is a kind of, you know, uh, national uh, research agency. Yeah, it's running the uh, event. And there is uh, many broadcasting uh, companies and uh, universities and some, you know, Cisco or Juniper, you know, a network vendor also involved. This is the topology, and these are the uh, Hokkaido part, Sapporo part, and uh, there is a camera L and R, and uh, these are deli uh, delivered through a different path uh, in the network onto the, you know, Osaka uh, public viewing site. And uh, we put the uh, Tokyo part, the Kami software router, and uh, the L uh, video is uh, branched by the Kami uh, and uh, delivered to the uh, site. And uh, it was, you know, uh, we were, uh, had a concern about the reliability uh, of our uh, software, but uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, kind of like a, a flawless success, eventually. You know, uh, even uh, someone is uh, making an attack to take down our software router Kamui, but, uh, you know, uh, duplication of IP attack only uh, breaks the, that, that single IP address on our software router. That's the only damage we could uh, receive. So the, eventually, it was very uh, strong. This is the uh, layer three uh, topology. Like, uh, you know, the routing protocol was PMSM, and uh, this is the RP. And uh, our part is here, and uh, we branch uh, the we get the uh, up, uh, 8K video from here and branch it to this. This is the traffic. Uh, the 8K full size uh, traffic uncompressed is uh, this number. So uh, 51 gigabps uh, totally. And uh, it's uh, using the jump up frame, uh, the PPS is like uh, 800,000 PPS. And it's kind of like, a, you know, three uh, days events. So uh, this is the upstream, and uh, we branched the uh, huge traffic into two downstream. Uh, yeah, this is a kind of uh, information for the, you know, uh, DPDK, you know, when you uh, run the DPDK, you know, almost uh, all the core that you assign the DPDK is running 100%, so uh, it's going to be like this. This is a top uh, result. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, comp optimization in the compile time is very, you know, uh, important. When you, uh, when you don't optimize in the compile time, then the, uh, in our uh, case, there is only six million loop in the, uh, each forwarding uh, process. But uh, when you do the uh, O3, then uh, it's gonna be 11 million. This is the 
the counter of the loop uh, that uh, with the uh, when the Kamui router is uh, forwarding a single stream, single 8K stream. This is like that. And uh, I, yeah, uh, we had a packet loss. And uh, uh, before the multicast event, uh, we could uh, resolve it. Uh, and this is a kind of like, a, you know, uh, for, for your information uh, story. But, uh, you know, the max PKT burst is the number of packets that you get, you read uh, from the DPDK. But uh, sometimes, you know, uh, because of the uh, bustiness of the traffic, you know, uh, we read 32 uh, packets that fills our receive buffer. And, uh, you know, there should be some more packets uh, left in the neck, uh, and we haven't read it. So that's the problem. And we, uh, you know, oh, uh, we uh, upgrade our uh, receive, and still, you know, DBDK somehow, I don't know, uh, returns 64 uh, packets uh, each time. So the, we read multiple times when we read up to 64 bytes. So that's the, and then the packet loss has gone then. So uh, if you are going to build a software radar on the DBDK, you might uh, encounter a similar problem. And also, uh, you know, it's a resource balance problem, but uh, you know, when uh, in uh, chasing the uh, packet loss, we uh, upgraded the uh, TX description uh, size in the NIC. That uh, Melanox uh, uh, suggested that to be the uh, 4,000. So we set that. And uh, we don't recognize uh, each NIC. Uh, so the uh, accidentally Intel uh, NIC, uh, for the Intel NIC, we set the same number. And the DPDK uh, uh, releases the uh, memory, I mean, the uh, freeze the MBAF. Uh, uh, in the uh, transmitting in the NIC. So, uh, you know, we cannot uh, free the MBAF by ourselves. The DPDK library does. And uh, it seems that the DPDK uh, uh, frees such buffer uh, relative to that uh, number. So the, we had a, you know, up uh, mempool, uh, yeah, up, um, uh, up mempool is, yeah, this one. And so the, the um, mempool exhausted uh, because the packet is not uh, freed in the uh, NIC or the, in the library uh, level. So the, that's the kind of like a memory leak problem. So we uh, switched back to the 500 TX desk. So uh, it, uh, it was uh, stable again. And yeah, one more thing uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, when we had a packet loss, we thought that, uh, you know, the software router is kind of like this, uh, you know, uh, re reliability. You know, we couldn't, uh, we may not be able to remove the packet loss at all, we thought. But uh, chasing the packet loss, uh, you know, eliminate the packet loss, then, uh, you know, we, uh, notice that the change of the route uh, doesn't uh, lose any packets, thanks to our uh, thanks to the RCU. Uh, you know, uh, we are using the RCU, and uh, there is a new routing table and the old routing table, and uh, uh, each forwarder is switching that uh, routing table, so the, there is no packet loss we could uh, achieve. Yeah, and uh, one more thing uh, is uh, uh, IPsec. Uh, we, in our uh, partner company, there is uh, Arrive Networks uh, based uh, in the US, and uh, they are building a smart NIC uh, using the uh, Intel uh, uh, FPGA NIC. And uh, they are building uh, uh, IPsec uh, DPDK uh, PMD uh, driver. 
So uh, when they build that, and uh, we, uh, it could be easily uh, incorporated with our software router. So the, it's kind of like a win-win situation, and uh, we could uh, easily uh, use the IPsec functionality in a high-performance way, and uh, that uh, arrive uh, network people uh, has the you know uh, layer three routing capability. So this is the kind of uh, preliminary performance. Uh, you know when you when you disable the uh, IPsec, the performance is kind of like this. Uh, it's depending on the packet size. Yes. Uh, in the short short uh, packet size, you know. Uh, Without IPsec, you get this performance, but uh, with a uh, AESNI, only the, this uh, performance can be uh, achieved. But uh, you know the Intel uh, uh, FPGA-based uh, Arrive uh, product could uh, perform like this, so it, it's going to be better than the AESNI. So we could uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, 80 gigabps uh, capable IPsec router uh, easily. You know, it's going to be uh, in a few months uh, we could uh, do that. This is the latency. Latency is not so uh, big difference, I think. And this is the, you know, internal structure. This is the Kamui, and this is the, you know, uh, uh, NIC part, FPGA part, and we're gonna add this SAD, SPD, and uh, support for the RT security, RT crypt of the DPDK uh, function. Then, uh, yeah. So it's the wrap up. Uh, it's working, uh, and we are seeking to make a real business out of this software. We proved uh, DPDK software router can perform significantly highly. And uh, yeah, BZP core router and the multicast router, we could uh, do that already. And uh, prospects is, you know, uh, because it's a software router, we could change everything. So, the, you know, for example, uh, implementing the SRV6 is kind of like a easier for us. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, any comment or questions? Please give your name. Warren Kamari, Google. So first off, thank you very much. This is very cool. Uh, something that I missed is, is this going to be something that I can just download and use, or is it going to be a commercial product, or what's the plan for making it available? Uh, yeah, we plan for the commercial product. Okay. And then the other question is, sometimes I also need to filter as well as sending packets. Do I fall out of DPDK and then go through a normal kernel IP tables lookup, or can you do something inline filtering or? Filtering, yeah. That's the you know, uh, challenging problem. You know. uh, and uh, you know, uh, there is a filtering library in the DPDK, and it's not so high performance. So the, we are kind of uh, uh, ch challenging. Uh, developing our uh, version of the software uh, filtering. And yes, so uh, uh, sacrificing the performance, then uh, yes, we could get the filter, but it's not implemented yet. As a comment or questions? Can I ask a question? So, uh, uh, this is our product of NTD. Right. So, uh, do you have a tutorial version of this software? Yeah, that's uh, that's our plan right now, and uh, we're gonna in short uh, time we're gonna provide a you know testing binary. Uh, it's gonna be a, a Debian package, and uh, you can apt install in the Ubuntu. That's that's our plan. That's good news. So, other comments or questions? So, thank you for the presentation. Let's applause. Thank you very much. So, uh, 
Uh, I have two announcements before conclusion. Uh, one is uh, we are doing a request for presentation of Lightning Talks. We'll have a Lightning Talk uh, this afternoon. Uh, if you have a talk or announcement, uh, please uh, apply uh, to the APNIC website. So, and the uh, other announcement is uh, tonight we have a uh, final light uh, social event. Uh, so uh, if you don't have the ticket to the event, uh, please ask uh, it uh, to APNIC guys. So uh, this is uh, uh, that uh, this uh, uh, sort of uh, next generation network. So uh, please have a break. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>